Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review, or at least making a start on a review, of Refugee Boy by Benjamin Zephaniah. So, a little bit of background, I've read a few of Zephaniah's books before and quite enjoyed them. He's quite a high profile vegan figure as well, he was actually at this year's vegan camp out, which I didn't go to because I'm supposed to be moving house, although in hindsight I could have gone to it, but hey ho. And um, yeah, I've read a few of his books, and then I picked up Gangster Rapper and was very unimpressed by it. So I decided I was going to take Benjamin Zephaniah off like my list of authors who I want to read all of the books by. Then I saw this in a charity shop, picked it up, and I've changed my mind again. So we're going to go through and check out the blurb, then check out my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. What I will say before we go in is kind of like a middle grade slash YA book, I suppose. Um, and it, it's very relevant, especially now with what's going on in Afghanistan and lots of refugees fleeing the country. Um, I think books like this are important, especially for younger people. So, the blurb. Dane reads. As the family lay sleeping, soldiers kicked down the door of the house and entered, waving their rifles around erratically. The soldier, who was in command, went and stood so that his mouth was six inches away from Aelan's father's ear and shouted, What kind of a man are you? Life is not safe for Aelan. His father is Ethiopian and his mother Eritrean, and with both countries at war, he is welcome in neither place. So his father does an astonishing thing which at first appears callous, but is in fact the ultimate gift of love from a parent to their child. With Aelam and his family, Benjamin Zephaniah has created a brave young man who despite all that happens to him, maintains a shining spirit of courage throughout. A powerful thought provoking novel that demands to be read. And um, one of the interesting things here, I mean that excerpt from the back is basically from the first two chapters and the reason why I say the first two chapters is because the first one is Ethiopia, the second is Eritrea, and literally they're exactly the same except for the mention of the place. And I think that in itself was quite a powerful decision of showing you like how, how stupid it is to hate people because of their nationality, you know. And then we get this, which James Lightfold, my character from the Lightfold books, would have loved. Uh, I think something was wrong with his hair. He looked burned. Did you see his hair? It was red, red like sunset. He looked hot, he looked burned. His father shook his head and they continued to walk. No, nothing is wrong with him. This type of hair is called ginger. In England, you will see many people with this colour hair. And you must not say burned, you must say burnt. The word is burnt. I think actually it depends whether you're using British English or American English. This is very true. His dad knows a lot about England, despite, you know, not being English or having spent any great amount of time here. So Alan says, it will rain, father, pointing to the sky. His father smiled. You haven't been here for one hour yet, but you've become English already. The English always talk about the weather. No, young man, that is not rain clouds, that is just English clouds. You'll get used to them, they come with the territory. And this is very telling of Alam's character, so we get... When they entered the village, things became a little busier, but still remained very orderly. And now Alan began to see animals. They were only dogs that people had on leads, but he was sure that he would soon see the local goats and chickens. And then he has a conversation with his dad, I'm just going to paraphrase it, but basically... His dad goes, do you know where uh, spaghetti comes from? And Alan says, Italy. And his dad goes, no, the uh, spaghetti we had back at home came from back home. Uh, but spaghetti here will taste Italian, not African. And then Alan's like, but how do you know the spaghetti here wasn't just made here? And his dad's like, wow, at least they're closer to Italy. So this is a long goal. Oh my God. Well, let's read this whole thing. This is chapter three in its entirety, one paragraph. But um, again, it, it basically gives you Alan's life story up until this point. Okay, chapter 3, this is war. My name is Alan Kello. My age is 14. I am from Africa. I was born in an area called Badme. Some people think this area is a part of Eritrea and some people think that this area is a part of Ethiopia. My father taught me that it was a part of Africa and he said that there is no country in Africa that is bigger than Africa. In 1991 when the big war was over I was 5 years old. My father and my mother and I went to live in Asmara. Asmara is a large city, the capital of Eritrea. My mother said we moved there so I could go to a good school and they could get better jobs. I did go to a good school there. It was a big school, a strong building. My mother and father did get good jobs. My mother worked in a court, she was the clerk, and my father worked in a post office. My father can speak six languages, Arabic, Afar, Tigrinya, Italian, English and Amharic. My mother can also speak these languages, but I can only speak Amharic, Tigrinya and English. But I want to learn many more languages and I want to make my English better. I did like Asmara, I had many friends there, but when I was 10 years old we all went to live in Harar. Harar is in Ethiopia, high in the hills. The sun shines bright there but it is very cool. I found a new school and I had a good friend there, his name is Dawit. My mother found a new job in the bank and my father was the manager of the biggest post office in the city. He was the most important person there and if there were problems everyone would have to come to him. We were happy living there until war broke out again and we began to have problems. 
Some of the other children at school started to pick on me, not do it, but some others. And then one day my mother came home and said that she had lost her job because nobody did want to work with her. She said that the manager said she was causing too much trouble. The Ethiopian workers said that they are at war with Eritrea, so they will not work with someone from Eritrea. She was very upset. And then some weeks later my father said the people at work said that he must leave my mother because she is Eritrean and she is the enemy. My father said no, and he kept on working there, but I think it was very difficult for him. Sometimes he came home from work and he didn't talk to us, and I think this is because he was having problems at work. And then one night when we were asleep, the police broke down the door of our house and then they began to break up the house. They broke all the tables and chairs, and they told us to get ready to leave in the morning because buses would be taking us back to Eritrea. My father told them that he was born in Ethiopia, so they said that if he loves Ethiopia he can stay, but me and my mother must go. My father said that he loves Ethiopia, he loves Eritrea and he loves Africa. One policeman then asked my father who would he fight for and my father said he would fight for peace and then the policeman hit my father with his rifle and my mother started to cry. When the police left we stayed awake all night and in the morning we went into the streets and we could see lots of people in the streets, many of them crying and getting onto buses. My father went to talk to a man and the man said he does not talk to traitors and then the police said that we must get on the bus right away and go to Eritrea and my father said no. Then one policeman pushed my mother on the floor and my father got angry and shouted at him and the policeman pointed the rifle in my father's face and told him that we have 15 minutes to go. So we went in our house and got as many things as we could, then we got on the bus and we went to Eritrea. The bus was full of Eritreans. When we went to Eritrea we stayed with my auntie, she is the sister of my mother. We had been there for about three months, then one day somebody was throwing some stones at my father when he was walking down the street. Then another day some women told my mother that she must leave my father and find a husband from Eritrea. In school in Eritrea, the children started picking on me again and calling me Ethiopian, and one day after school some very big boys all started to beat me up when I was playing sport. They were very big, almost 20 years old. They beat my face and my stomach, and when I was on the ground they just kept kicking me very hard. One boy said he was going to kick all the Ethiopian blood out of me. After this my mother and father were always talking about what they could do. They said Eritrea and Ethiopia were at war, and our family is both Eritrean and Ethiopian. My mother said that we tried to live in both places and we always have problems. Then one day, it was my birthday, my father said I should have a holiday. He said that a holiday would make me happy and I will forget the problems. My mother was trying to find a job, she said she would not come. So my father took me to Djibouti by bus and from there we flew to Addis Ababa and from there we flew to England. I was thinking that we came here for a holiday so that I could practice my English and see the buildings, but my father left me here so that I will not die. We get a quote from one of his uh, care workers, she says, uh, there is no one more innocent than you, but look at the way you've been treated. Criminals are all over the world, but the big difference between a dictatorship and a democracy is that in a democracy, the criminals are voted in. Oh, we get a reference to uh, Alan playing CD-ROMs, which just made me chuckle. Obviously, that kind of dates the book, but also, like, CD-ROMs? No, we used to just call them CDs. Why, why ROM? That means read-only memory. I suppose it implies that it is not a rewritable CD. And we get this awful thing as well, he says, uh, he might not have put great effort into keeping up with what was happening with the war back home, but not a day passed without him thinking about his parents. It was hard trying to remember his parents and forget the war at the same time. But imagine that as a quandary to have as a little kid. And, and then one of the kids asks Alan what he does in his spare time and he says, I read. And we get, you read, Robert said in a mild state of shock. Reading is what you do in school. Reading is what you do when you're told to. So what do you do when you're not reading then? I think, Alan replied. And he makes a friend who's into music and it says, uh, he had a great love of singer-songwriters, most of whom were no longer walking the earth. John Lennon, Bob Marley and Kurt Cobain were among his favourites. Good list. And then we get this, um, which takes a look at the kind of inherent racism and xenophobia that's just a part of, like, mainstream media, basically. She handed him a folder that he opened. It contained a wad of newspaper cuttings. These are just from some of today's papers, Mariam said, leaning back in her seat. Read them. Alan glanced at the cuttings. The headlines jumped out at him one after the other. Government to clamp down on asylum seekers, gypsies, tramps and thieves, refugee beggars flood London streets, government plan to build new detention centre for bogus refugees, opposition party proposed prison ship for asylum seekers, 57 asylum seekers found dead in container at Dover. What is this all about? Alam asked. Me and my husband are Irish, Mrs Fitzgerald replied. We weren't born here, you know. I came here when I was nine. My mother and father were starving. This country has helped us. This country has a lot to offer. But sometimes the newspapers and the politicians will pick on people to show how powerful they are and make us forget about the real problems. Get the Irish out. Stop the travellers. Stop the gays. Blame the nurses and blame the teachers. They do it all the time. Now it's get the refugees out. 
Mr. Fitzgerald made one of his rare interruptions. That's right, boy. There was a time when we had to be careful just because we were Irish. We were treated as if we were all members of the IRA, and I tell you no lie, not so long ago, anyone who had any ideas of their own were called loony left or communist, and if you believed most of those so-called newspapers, all the ills in the country were caused by them. Now they want to tell us that the blacks and the refugees are causing all our problems. The truth is that the number of people that leave this country each year is much higher than the number of people that come here. And you know, if people didn't come from abroad, we wouldn't have a health service or a bus service and most of the great British corner shops would be gone and guess what mate don't just take it from me check up on it even the royal family yes even that lot they came from abroad these politicians make me sick yeah he's he's got a good point and this uh, again illustrates the difference between Alem and some of his classmates he missed playing creatively. Back home he once found a front bicycle wheel and decided to make a bike he had to seek out and even manufacture parts one day at Great Milford, he was told by a boy that his parents had bought him a new bike because the front wheel had broken and his mum thought it was bad luck. And now here's some of the books that Alan has been reading. It says, On Christmas Day, Alan read George Orwell's 1984. On Boxing Day, he started Lord of the Flies and finished it on 29th December. He rested on the 30th and on New Year's Eve, when it seemed like everyone else was counting down the hours and the minutes towards the new millennium, Alan walked to Barking Road and bought a brand new 30 speed bike. And uh, he has to go for his hearing and uh, his foster parents give him a suit and he's like, why do I need to wear this? Um, and and uh, we get, very good, Mrs. Fitzgerald replied, acknowledging Alan's logic. But this is all about you. You'll be standing there right in front of the judge. He'll be looking straight at you. I know these things. A suit will make a good impression. Take my word for it. I know how these people judge character. Alan rubbed his eyes again and paused for thought. If these judges are so intelligent, they should know that you cannot always judge by first impressions. They should know that a suit is just pieces of material sewn together and that you cannot judge a person's character by the pieces of material that they wear. And besides, I thought the judge was going to look at the facts, why I'm here and can I stay, things like that. I didn't think he was going to judge my character. Unfortunately, that's not how the world works, is it? All right, then Alan gets given some tickets to the Millennium Dome and he gets very excited about going to it. And it's kind of funny because at the time that this book came out, the Millennium Dome was like this big thing open for the Millennium. And now it's, I mean, there are exhibitions and stuff there and there are concerts there, but it used to be something that you would go to specifically to go to the Millennium Dome. And now it's just like a venue you go to for something else, you know? It's no longer really an attraction in its own right. And then we hear about this, this teenage band and they have songs like, Who are the living? She took my coat and I believe in acne, which are great cho uh, choices for song titles. So yeah, Refugee Boy by Benjamin Zephaniah. I think it's a very important book. It's good that there are like YA books about this kind of stuff that go into like, you know, the effects of war on kids and um, refugees and basically it's got that kind of message that we're all human beings at the end of the day, you know? So I appreciate what it was trying to do. Uh, pretty much enjoyed the story as well. I gave it a pretty solid 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it, those are my thoughts on Refugee Boy by Benjamin Zephaniah. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.